Let's open it up because we have, uh, roughly speaking, 20 minutes. Anybody got uh, questions for Tony? That, if you haven't, I can keep talking to Tony because I did so last night very successfully. Anybody want to ask Tony a question? Gentleman at the back there. Tony, congratulations on your achievement to date. One question maybe that hasn't been, it's a negative thing. How, it, there must be, running a corporation that size, there must be areas that you feel you may not have your finger on the pulse, maybe. And if there is, how do, you, how do you deal with that? Or do you see areas in your business that you don't have your finger on the pulse? Well, if, if I saw them, uh, we'd, we'd change it very quickly. Um, so the, the answer is you always are continually surprised by things that happen that you don't expect. I mean, you know, there are people let you down from time to time, managers that you were great at one particular moment in time all of a sudden go off for whatever reasons in their own personal life or they get demotivated from, from the point of view of, of something happens to them or the pressure. Uh, I mean, running a box plant or running a mill, the pressure is intense. You have to deal with unions, you have to deal with customers, you've got to deal with bosses, you know, and sometimes after a while, people get tired of it. And uh, So I think the disappointment you sometimes have is that you have to make changes that you know, that you didn't expect to make. So that, that's the kind of surprise that you get. You get surprises in the marketplace, your competitors do stupid things. In our own company, the thing that worries me is, most of all, is, you know, that one or two of our managers, because, you know, as I said, we've 42,000 people, not all of them are managers, but some of our managers might do stupid things, illegal things, and we try and put, we've, we put in very strong um, uh, code of conduct uh, across our company to make sure that people don't do stupid things, but you know we can't we can't legislate for everyone, and that that that's the worry that I have that somebody out there is doing something illegal. I mean we have, as I said, 18 internal auditors, so we don't thus far touch wood have too many problems with internal fraud. We have a little bit, you know, from time to time we find somebody's robbed 50 euros or whatever, uh, but. You know, so far, touch wood, we haven't had that many problems, but it's, it's more, is somebody doing something wrong that I don't know about? And that's what we have to try and mitigate against. Now, if people have other questions, just please put up your hands, because I want to ask you, continuing on that theme, physically or literally, the reporting to you, 42,000 people working for you, operations all over the world, have you got a massive big bank of screens that will tell you what's happening everywhere, or no, no, do you no, just no. load the paper? Uh, no, I have. I, I mean, the way that I operate specifically is I operate by communication. I mean, I speak all the time to my senior management in all the countries. Um, uh, so but typically, your working day would be, say, on that side of the business. Say half the time on the phone. Hiya, Jimmy. How's it going? Uh, what's happening? What, down what's there? what's who's doing what? Uh, what our competitors doing, and then you meet a lot of cu customers. You know, try and meet as many customers as you possibly can. But you know, that's something that, you know, if 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 I was to be critical of myself, is that we are not spending uh, as an organisation. We need to spend more time with our customers, and that's one of our. Uh, as we went through our think tank at the end of the year, what do we have to do more of this year and next year is try and get out more to our customers because we spend a lot of time uh, dealing with the issues that are of the day. But you know, at the end of the day, it's a customer that pays the bill, and so we have to spend more time with them. Um, that's something that I mean, we do spend a lot of time, but you know, you can never have enough. And if you hear from Jimmy in Colombia that the such and such plant is not working properly, you take a note, and then how do you change things? If the guy is not working, he he, he if will. If the leave. plant say if the if the plant isn't isn't yeah. working, the, the the I mean, at the end of the day. Well, when we look at through history of our business, it's always a down to management. I mean, you know, the worst equipped plants can have very good results, and equally the best equipped plants can have very bad results because it's it's down to the management that runs it. And so, you know, you, we tend to the mistakes we've made is we tend to give management too much time to solve their problems, um, and we know in our heart of hearts sometimes a manager who's running a factory isn't up to it and we have to make a change, but we give him too much time. Doctor, we give him as much time as we possibly can to, 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 to be successful, but in the end, we do make the change. You take out a big X? Probably. There are now questions. There's a question, this gentleman here, and then this lady here. Gentleman. 
Oh, sorry, we'll start with the lady here, please. Yeah. How are you doing? Fiona Connolly, Lines of Limerick. Uh, very interesting listening to you this morning. Um, just a quick question. With regard to motivating your management team, obviously they must be extremely happy to have only lost two out of the management team in the last couple of years. Just wondering, how do you motivate them? Is it purely financial? And is there different motivating factors across the different countries, your South American versus Ireland and European and that? Thank you. It's, it's a very good question. I mean, of course, remuneration is an important part of it. We pay for performance, so therefore, we would be we have uh, a an organisation that is well paid, and then if the company does well, they get remunerated on top of bonuses. So they're happy, generally. Well, they're not. They're never happy, but I mean, uh, we're somewhat happy with the remuneration of the of the people. So that's part of it. But it, it's about being part of a winning team. Uh, I mean, um, so far, I think that you know. The people that have left us want to come back, uh, which is a good, good sign, the ones that we, 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 we didn't want to lose. Um, and I think that um, you know, being part of a winning team like Smurf for Capital, people are proud to work for the company. I mean, we need to do more to enhance that experience, but it's something that we're actually currently working on, is to get people to even more identify with this company. Uh, but I think people who work in the company are genuinely proud that this is the go-to company in our sector. You know, it's not a very big sector, I have to say. I mean, packaging, uh, corrugated packaging is not the most seen as the most glamorous uh, world from the outside. But when you're in it, it's quite good. You know, and, and as to different sectors, different countries and cultures, I think, you know, I would say that. There's not that much difference when you're talking about management, about the, the, the difference between the, how people feel about the, co the company within the different cultures. I think that, that everybody's on the same, on the same wavelength. Uh, Shane McCarthy from Blue Chief. You've addressed motivational factors. I'm just curious, what to you is the key in identifying the right, or as you put it, the excellent people to help scale your business? That, that is what we have in the company, we have what we call an advanced management course, so we identify, obviously you get a lot of people coming into a company of our size, we identify the good young people that are coming through and we put them through our own training programs, we, we, we I shouldn't say this here, they go to the Michael Smurfit Business School in Dublin, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have been offered to come down here before now. Uh, um, and. Uh, uh, we do. We, we so we, we bring our young people forward. Uh, we identify them. We we give we, we put them in at the deep end sometimes to see if they can sink or swim, uh, and and we motivate them to because when you when you're running a box plant, you are running your own business. I mean, you are running. You're dealing, as I said, with unions, bosses, customers, local regulator, re, local regulators. So there's a a massive amount to do, so you're, you're actually running your own business, and that's a very motivating for people with the security of having a big company behind you, the resources of a big company behind you. They have to fight, the one thing they have to fight, do for us is good financial discipline and fight for capital. I mean, we are capital allocators in our company, so we, we tend to, we spend this year about 370 million investing in our business. Um, we. Uh, everyone has to fight for their capital, based on obviously health and safety first, and then return second. Um, and then, uh, and with so many operations, we've over 350 operations. That's a hard fight, and and that, it's my job to figure out who deserves the capital. Gentleman behind there. For Pyra, that does research into paper packaging, printing, and publishing. And I was curious about how you manage your R&D process and if you see trends in terms of intelligence, intelligent packaging, where the packaging can maybe connect to the internet, or is there anything like that coming down the line? Uh, there is, uh, there's chips that are going into packaging to help um, uh, Identify, scan th straight through uh, through the warehouses of, of our, our the distribution centres. That hasn't really taken off yet. I mean, 25 years ago we, we were talking about this around the time that you were in Pira, uh, and in fact I used to get your reports. So because um, I was running a small uh, plastic bag plant at that time, 
Um, but I think that um, you know there's there's all sorts of new developments in in packaging, lighter weight packaging. Uh, different way. I mean, one of the environmental co corporate social responsibility issues is to reduce your packaging, uh, reduce your carbon footprint, and part of that is, you know, we would say we're in an extremely good space for that because unlike plastic, we're recyclable, renewable, you know, so we have a very strong offering in the whole area of corporate social responsibility, and, and we think that's a winning edge for corrugated packaging. Um, but in regard to R&D, we have our R&D center, I have to say it's in the middle of nowhere in northern Holland, um, but it does, uh, there's not much to do there except R&D, so uh, that's why we have it there. Uh, at least that's our story, that's not really true. Uh, but um, no, it came with the CAFA organization, and um, we, we, uh, um, uh, we're, we're really advanced with regard to retail-ready packaging, helping our customers you know, see their products on the shelf in 3D before they actually have to do it. What will it look like at the start of the day? What will it look at the end of the day? And we have these visual centers. So it's more in that area rather than technologically, other than reducing the weight of packaging, other than technologically, you know, is there something that's going to, you know, beam, beam me up Scotty type thing? No. Thank you very much. The gentleman to the rear there, please. Yep. Yeah. How are you doing? Jimmy Martin from AMCS Group. Um, just two unrelated questions. One on the whole recycling of um, the whole recycling of packaging material and the whole that whole side. Can you just share with us what your thoughts on that? And do you see Smurfit getting into the waste recycling side of the business? We we are the largest recy recycled paper use maker and buyer in Europe, uh, and one of the largest in the world. So we we buy a lot of of uh, used paper and you know repulp it basically paper is is fibers that are are put into water uh, and then put onto a big machine and and dried again um, and we buy a lot of those we are also in virgin areas in the sense that we have we have our we, we do make paper from trees um, but the we're the biggest recycler in europe and uh, that's something we continue to to do i mean so do we, don't, we don't we don't go into we, we have some of our depots which collect this recycling do other things like cans and a little bit of plastic, but we try and stick to our knitting, which is basically recycled paper. 